We're at the Kuyong Tennis Club in Melbourne, Australia, and we're about to check in with an absolute tennis legend, Judy Taggart Dalton, and she was one of the original founding nine members of the WTA, which has done so much, not only for women's tennis, but for women's sport in general. So let's go have a chat with Judy and see what she's got to say. Now, Judy, take us back to how did tennis all get started for you? Um, I was five. Yeah. And my father played tennis. He was a good tennis player. Came from Ireland. And um, and in those days, of course, they didn't have little rackets. You know, they had these huge rackets. So I, I tried to play with, with big rackets. Never, I never had very good ground strokes because of it, I tell you. But somehow, I learned to serve and volley. Um, and I, then when we were about, when I was about 10, because it wasn't like today where if you're in a five and you're a reasonable player, you know, they think you're wonderful. And um, so they have here in, the, in each of the school holidays, they have different tournaments, schoolgirls tournaments, schoolboys tournaments. And one of them was here, they used to play at Kuyong. Um, and so we all just played in the, in the tournaments and played doubles and singles. We used to ride our bicycles to the tournaments. I didn't play for a little while from 16 because there was no overseas tours. So I went and played basketball and I must have been reasonably good at it because they said to me, would you like to try it for the Australian team? And I said, oh no, thank you. I think I'll just stick to tennis. But there was nothing, but there was nothing there. Like, you know, there... and so the next, the following year, they select this team and they didn't pick me, even though I was number two in Australia, because I was too old, because I was 22 then, because, you know, I'd had the big gap. So in 62, because I worked for an accountant, so I used to buy shares at, at par, you know, how they float shares. Mm -hmm. and, um, so I bought some and then I sold some when they were, came on the market and saved it and I bought my first air ticket and went off. And in those days, you know, we had to write letters because there was nothing like emails or anything like that. And you had to wait until you got a reply. So that was like a month for letter getting there and a month to get back. And um, they had, um, I played the Caribbean the first time, Caribbean circuit, which was like Bogota and a lot in South America, um, in um, Jacksonville, in Florida, in, oh, on Bermuda and things like that. And what happened was all the tournament directors um, sit around a the table, they might have eight tournaments say, and, they, and you, they have a list of names who want to play in the tournament. So you're the tournament director of say this one and I'm the tournament director of New South Wales. And you say, oh, I want this person, this person, this person. And in those days, of course, there wasn't any prize money, but they had under the table money. So for instance, one of the tournaments in uh, South America, because Bueno, Maria Bueno was such a huge figure, and she got $800 a week for the tournament because they all agreed to, to put in the money. And that was a huge amount because Labor only got 700. So that was showed you how popular she was doing well. Yeah. And, um, and then I can't remember how much I got. I might've got 500 or 600, I can't remember. And then we'd know that that money was there. So once we'd got our ticket, we'd then go to the tournament and then that would be our money. Yeah. And then we'd play each of the tournaments, you know. And it didn't matter whether you did well or whether you didn't. Mind you, I suspect that if you hadn't done too well the first three or four, they'd be saying it. <laughs> and then you kind of built up a little, a little bit. But in, but we were lucky because in those days Hilton was just building hotels, so we 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 had the wonderful expense of going into brand new hotels, which was wonderful for us. Because the other times we had to stay privately in all the other places. But we met, you know, I met lovely people along the way, and it was it was great. But so that's, that was my start. Now, during your career, you played and were very successful, especially in doubles at all the other yep. Grand Slams. Yep. Tell us a little bit about that and if you have like a, a favorite match or a favorite slam. Oh, well, Wimbledon's special. If you win Wimbledon, they sort of say, everybody aims to be, the, everybody aims to win Wimbledon. But in those days, the Australian was played here, of course, on grass courts, not like the hard courts, isn't it? Um, and of course, um, so there were three grass courts then. We were lucky because there was the US, Wimbledon here, and Roland Garros was the only one that wasn't. Mm, probably, well, probably the f favorite match, or maybe the funniest one was, I played with Margaret in the final of Wimbledon, which we won, but we were playing this pair who, we hadn't lost a match for umpteen weeks in a row, I don't think. And we played a pair who really shouldn't have been in the final, but they played well enough to get there. And um, 
we were, I don't know, four, three or something in the first set. And Margaret said, I think I'm getting cramps, I'm getting nervous. I said, Smithy, you can't possibly be getting nervous. It's four, three in the first set and you've hardly played a match. Um, and so I had to coax her through because people forget that she was left-handed. And when she got under pressure, she couldn't, she couldn't handle it very well. She, she found it very difficult. And that's why her, her record, when you think about it, in singles and everything, was so amazing because she got so nervous. Like, you can't compare her with Billy playing this because they were entirely different characters. You know, if you had to sort of say, well, y y you've got to play, who would you choose to play your li life on? You'd choose Billy, you'd never choose Margaret. But yet, when you look at the records, it's phenomenal what Margaret did compared to Billy. So anyway, we, I coached her through and we eventually won something like 7-5-6-2 or something. So, so that, was, that was a strange match, I must say, you know. Did you have a favourite doubles partner throughout the years? Well, I played a lot of mixed doubles um, and I played with Tony Roach a lot. Um, and, um, and I played with a guy who I don't think even, the, even Americans would remember, a guy called Eddie Rubinoff who was a lawyer from Florida and he was left-handed and didn't do anything in singles, but he was very shrewd, double straight. And we played a couple of tournaments and he said, oh, would you, would you play with me in the US Open? And I said, sure. Um, and we got to the final three times with him and we couldn't, we, we lost to Margaret Court and Fletch one year when they won the Grand Slam, the whole four. Because he was so small and he didn't really have a good overhead, it was hard, you know. But he was a very clever player, so so it was amazing. But nobody, when I talk to him, nobody has heard of him. No, and yet he was actually a very good player, you know. I mean, and take us also back to when you made the shift from being an amateur tennis player to being one of the original nine to sign the, the bill and become a pro with the WTA. Oh, that was, that was all happened at the US Open. And um, because we were still at West Side then, um, the, Jack Kramer was running a tournament Pacific Coast, and they had something like four of the top 20 men in the world, and we, there was eight of the top 10 girls in the world who were going to play. And we were, and Ju, um, Julie Heldman's mother, Gladys, you know who owned World Tennis. Um, she she said to Jack Kramer, look, you know, don't you think this is very unfair that, you know, that there's hardly any of the top men playing and yet there's eight of the top girls playing. And the prize money was eight to one. So they, so for instance, I can't remember the exact money, but say they had 8,000, we had 1,000 to play. And she said, couldn't you try and make any difference? And, and he said, no, 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 he's not going to change. So we said, oh, well, we won't play the tournament. And so he said, fine, you know, so we said, okay. So we decided we had to do something then. And what we did is we put together a questionnaire and we had all these questions down and we, we wrote them on a bit of paper and printed them off and handed them to the people as they came in through the gates. And we said, would we really appreciate it if you answer these? And a, there were one or two questions, but the most pertinent one was, if you were a man, would you go and watch women's tennis? And 48% of the people said, yes, they would. So we thought that if you've got 48% of the women, you know, men watching women's tennis, we've got a good chance of succeeding. And we asked them why, and they said, because we can associate our game with yours. They can't with the men's, but they could with the women's. So then Gladys, we all decided that we would try and start a, start a thing. So um, we asked all the players, and there was only, there was 10 of us who said, look, we'll, we're prepared to break away. And um, the 10th one was um, Patty Hogan, one of your American girls. And she couldn't because she was playing in a tournament in England. She'd already committed. Um, but she always sort of stayed in touch. So there was nine of us who went and we had this meeting and we, we all had to sort of decide what we we're going to do. And she said, well, you'll have to become I can't remember, there's a, there's a difference between a contract professional and a playing professional, but legally I'm not sure what the difference is, but we had to sign for an amount just to become a professional. So Gladys said, well, why don't we just sign for a dollar? So we did that. We all signed the dollar and I'm the only one that's got the dollar. 
I really we only, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so I, I think I'll give it to the hall of to the International Hall of Fame when it, you know, be, so it's not lost, you know. And um, and so then we signed the dollar, and then of course we didn't realise of all the repercussions of what had happened, because by doing that, Kerry Melvin and I, who was also an Australian, we wanted to play back here, and they wouldn't let us. They they banned us from playing. We couldn't use. Dunlop rackets, we couldn't use the shoes, we couldn't play in any of these tournaments, we couldn't play the Australian. We went to play in New Zealand because they said we could play in theirs, and the ITF said, oh, we'll suspend New Zealand Association, so they were suspended because of that. And then the USTA said to the other girls, you can't play in any of the tournaments. And by the ITF saying that, it meant that future things would be that we couldn't play Roland Garros, any of the Grand Slams, which was going to be a huge thing. Gladys worked and worked and we, we tried. And of course, it was very difficult because you have to remember that she had to send everything on a telegram. There was nothing like emails or anything or else she'd have to telephone. And um, eventually we persuaded the ITF that we really weren't professionals signing for a dollar. And so they agreed that it was fine. So then we had to then try and see if we could get some tournaments. So we played the first tournament in Dallas, oh, in Houston, sorry, at the Racquet Club. And it was quite a good success. Like there were quite a few people came. So Philip Morris then decided that because they were going to launch Virginia Slim Cigarette, that maybe that'd be the way that we could, that we could do it. So that's how the Virginia Slim Circuit started really. It started that tournament and then went from there and then, then, then they started in the January of the next year and, and we, we, we then started the whole Virginia Slims tour. Was it tough? Because I know you were a very tight-knit group so you're yeah. travelling together. Oh, it was was it tough to then go out and play against each other? It was, it was. But you know, because we had such good camaraderie, yeah. um, if say for instance somebody wasn't playing very well, then we all watched them and practiced and said, well why don't you try this or try that or do that? And, and it was tough because if you played in the tournament and lost, then you had to go to the next tournament to promote that tournament at that city. You know, if you lost for a few day, a few weeks in a row, then you had to keep with the first one to get out and go to the next thing and try and promote them. And, um, and so we did everything. We went to shopping malls, we went to, oh, we did clinics for women. We, we did everything before we played the matches, you know. It's not like today. <laughs> So speaking of today's game, obviously women's tennis has come a long, long way. Did you have any idea back then when you signed that dollar no, what that not, meant for no. women's sport? Well, no, we didn't really, but we hoped. We hoped. Um, we, our principal thing wasn't for equal prize money. Our principal thing was for recognition, for the opportunities to be able, and for at least some money so that we could make a, a proper living. You know, not, not like today where it's huge but you know that we could do that and I think that by us doing that in 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 that sport it then sort of flowed over to the other sports and we you know we changed title nine because um, there was there was a huge difference between the men and the women in the universities and once we 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 done what we we did then the universities changed and then it was 50 50 so the women got an opportunity as well in all sports not just in um, tennis what are some of the things you look back on now that you're most proud of? Um, well, I'm proud of what we did, what we stood for, because it was really tough. And I think um, because we gave other sports opportunities, you know, like I was saying um, today in luncheon that I met a girl at the Renaissance Golf Club in Ed out of, in North Berwick, it is, and she served behind the bar. And she came over and said, oh, are you Judy Dalton? And I said, yes. And she said, oh, I just want to thank you because she said I'd never have played professional soccer if it hadn't been for you. Because they, she couldn't get a scholarship until we changed Title IX. And so once we changed that, she got the scholarship, did her education, went on to play professional soccer. So, so a it was a lovely you're, story. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're seeing that impact in other sports as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, it was it was and and it was lovely because we took a photograph and and we I showed it to all the girls and said, you know, look look, this is what we've done, you know, because none of us realised that we didn't. Like, but you had to meet somebody who the effect that it had because we we seen it on tennis but not on other sports. Now, looking at the, today's game, do you have a favourite player that you like to follow on the WTA? Um, 
Yes, I quite like. Well, well, I quite like Rubikina. I must say, I like it because she doesn't. Um, you know, she's very um, ca calm about everything. You know, in every situation, she doesn't. Sh like, she's not not motionless. I don't mean that, but she doesn't show too much and she's very good about everything and sort of accepts it all and and you know in a way it was sad that when she won Wimbledon she really didn't get the recognition that she that she, that she deserved really because to be a Wimbledon champion something so I, I, I quite li I like her I must say I do like her. Now do you still get out and have yeah, a few Yeah I try and have, yeah. a, have a hit yes yeah. yes Very yes. Nice. Yeah. Supposedly if you keep playing tennis it keeps you living longer or something like that. <laughs> Well, that's hope. That's the case. Thank you so much for taking time welcome. to join us today. Cheers. It's a pleasure.